everyone. Um, um, and um, I think we've got still got a few people, uh, a few people joining. So, um, but I'm going to just do some of the boring welcoming and housekeeping stuff while people join. So, um, my name is Tara Garnett, and I'm the director of Table, a collaboration between the universities of Oxford, Wageningen, and the Swedish Agricultural University. Um, and welcome to the uh, third and last in a series of events we've been organising in the run up to COP27, which has been focusing on some of the key debates in and around livestock. I would love to say that more details of our other events are available in the chat and actually links to them are available in the chat, but the table website is down because uh, the School of Geography's website at Oxford is down. Um, but if you if you bookmark um, those links, they'll as soon as as soon as the website's up, it'll be back hopefully to normal. So um, yeah, um, it's, um, I'm really looking forward to today's event and the purpose of which is to explore different argued visions of what a good future for livestock looks like. Um, and on the panel joining me today are what I'd say, well, currently four panellists, but we will have a fifth at the end. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in a minute, but before doing so, I thought it would be useful to uh, give a bit of background to this idea of four argued visions um, because they're inspired by, it's a, basically back in um, 2015, um, I wrote a report called Gut Feelings, which is again available on the website, which explored four hypothetical envisaged scenarios of what a good future for livestock and for meat and dairy eating might look like. Um, and they have um, inspired a, a new project that we'll be launching in November at Table called Meet the Four Futures, which is a combination of a podcast, quizzes, visuals, and, and a great deal more. And again, there'll be links to that. But what I want, and, and what I've invited these, we've invited these four speakers because each of them uh, we feel reflects um, or could be seen as representative of one of those scenarios. Uh, to explain more, uh, this was a report I wrote uh, partly for personal reasons, because as all of you probably who are attending this panel know, uh, discussions about meat and dairy and what a good future for livestock looks like are incredibly polarized and contested. And every time I was in a different room talking to different a different person, I would hear a slightly different analysis of what the food problem actually was and a slightly different um, argument for what a good future might look like. And to try and get my head around these, I decided to kind of systematize those conversations into different sets of arguments. I thought it'd be clarifying for me, at, um, at least. And so I, I constructed these four scenarios and essentially, I hear four different overlapping um, analyses of what the food problem is. At one level, there is an analysis that says, our problem is that we have lots of people on the planet, growing numbers of people on the planet, and there is not enough food, or there is not enough food produced in sustainable ways. And the, the solution to this is to innovate, innovate to produce more food with less impact. Um, and that will meet our demands for uh, growing quantities of food in the future. Then there's a second scenario, that a second analysis that, that one also hears, which is, the, which is the argument that there's plenty of food in the world. It's that um, it would be perfectly possible to feed our current and growing numbers um, if we were to be less greedy, if we were to consume in less resource intensive ways. So what we really need to do is modify our demand for high impact foods um, and, and that's that's a way forward. And then there's a final argument that I hear that it's not a question of too much or not enough. It's a question of imbalance and it's a question of injustice. The problem is actually inequality. And what we need to do is restructure the system uh, to more evenly distribute both, both the food and the means of production. And if you put them together, and at this point, I'm gonna share my screen, um, you see four um, visions of 
I'm just going to get it, get it up like this. Four articulated visions of what a good future might look like. And so this was inspired the, the, the gut feelings report. And these are very, very hypothetical visions. But the first one, which is, you could call it the bottom right, which you could call an efficiency scenario, sees the problem as um, growing numbers of people wanting more resource intensive animal proteins, um, that it is right and proper that people should want these foods, that they are rich in micronutrients, um, and that um, and that there are plenty of people in the uh, developing world who don't have access to sufficient quantities of high, high quality protein. So what we need to do is cater to this growing demand by producing more meat with less impact. And this, pre and this, this is possible, <clears throat> and this is in keeping with um, trends in innovation, technological development, breeding, feeding, housing changes over time. The global population is already shifting its demand towards monogastric animal proteins, and this is a good thing because these animals pro uh, don't produce methane. So what, what we should do in this scenario is innovate further and give people more of the meat that they seem to want, which is heading in the right direction, in even more um, uh, efficient ways. That, that's one scenario uh, for a good future for food. Uh, another scenario, which is uh, top right, the man with the um, with the microscope, takes as its starting premise some similar ideas. It it accepts that our growing population, our, our population is growing. That people want more meat. They want this more uh, resource intensive meat as populations become more affluent and so or, so on. That this is fine. This is right and proper. But but technology can go a step further it can bypass the animal altogether. It can give people what they want at um, with less environmental impact. So this is where things like cellular agriculture, um, fermented proteins, all sorts of alternative forms of protein come in. It's, it's bypassing the animal, eliminating animal suffering to boot and drastically reducing both land use and carbon emissions. Then there's a, a third way of looking at the livestock problem, which is to say, and this is the sort of bottom left, which say you have totally missed the point about animals. What are animals good at? They're good at recycling nutrients, at uh, utilizing land and resources that can't be consumed directly by humans and by fostering uh, natural cycles of carbon, water, as well as um, shaping the landscapes and the biodiversity that um, we have grown to love and value. So what we need to do is return to a more, um, you could call it livestock on leftovers, more regenerative vision of what animals are for. And this would presuppose going away actually from monogastric production and shifting to, to more ruminants, the sheep and goats and, 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 and cattle that can make use of indigestible grass, indigestible to us, um, and all these residues, and that can be reintegrated into uh, cropping systems. And, and the idea here is that if we do this, we will need to modify current trajectories of demand, but there will be enough meat for everyone. And in this sense, animals are actually not just you're reducing the environmental impacts of livestock, but you're actually um, you're actually regenerating the system, um, adding adding benefits. And then there's a final scenario, the top left beans on top, which which says, well, it it, it rejects the idea that uh, that demand growth is inevitable, but it also rejects the idea that livestock are needed in a sustainable food system. And it argues for a, um, a, a less exploitative when it comes to animal death and suffering um, and, and argues for a plant-based future. And, and it takes as its starting point the fact that diets have always changed over time, that, that demand is, is a cultural construct and that we can shift to a sustainable plant-based future without relying on the sort of high-tech visions of cellular agriculture, um, but without requiring animals in the system. So that's, that's very, very 
broadly and crudely what what those scenarios set out and of course the future is never going to be one thing um, but all I tried to do with this thought experiment was explore how and why those futures might come about what the arguments were that would give rise to it and and what problems um, might also might also occur and of course there's problems with with all of them so so that's kind of more or less enough for me and I do want to emphasize that these are inevitable simplifications um I did this in, back in 2015 and that's a very very long time ago and of course the world has changed uh, since then in a zillion ways but that said debates about livestock haven't gone away and I'd say they've evolved possibly rather than radically changing and and I think to my mind they become even more polarized than ever before so we felt that there's something in this scenarios that that might merit further exploration hence um hence our meet the four futures uh, project that's going to be launching um anyway i will stop sharing screens and i will stop talking and um all i'm going to do now is introduce our four speakers um four panelists and they're each going to pitch their vision of a good future, and then we'll open up to a panel discussion and we'll allow about 25 minutes at the end for a Q&A. So in no particular order, um, as Adele Jones, um, and please, please turn on your screen, I, you, I think you all have, most of you, yes, your screens. Um, Adele is the Executive Director at the Sustainable Food Trust and uh, has been a driving force behind the development of its global farm metric, which is a common international framework for measuring on-farm sustainability. And she's also an advisor to the Scottish government. Um, Professor Jude Kapper is um, ABP Chair in Sustainable Beef and Sheep Production at Harper Ad Adams University here in the UK, and has a long career as a, an independent sustainability, livestock sustainability consultant, both in the US and the UK. Ian Tolhurst is uh, the owner of Tolhurst Organic Farms um, near Oxford, um, and he's been farming organically for more than 30 years now. So the farm is stock free. So it's both organic and it doesn't um, use any livestock or livestock products and everything is harvested and sold locally. And then um, finally, last but not least, uh, Varun Deshpande, who's the Managing Director for Asia of the Good Food Institute. The Good Food Institute is a nonprofit organization working internationally to accelerate alternative protein innovation. We also, and this is the, the plus one panelist, is really happy to have Cor van der Weel, um, who will be, she's a professor in philosophy at Wageningen, um, originally trained as a biologist. And she's been studying changing appreciations of meat and cultured meat for the last 12 years. Um, and she will be offering some final reflections at the end. So sort of that, I, it, the next is over to, and I think I'd perhaps do it in this order, um, starting with Jude. Perhaps you could spend a couple of minutes and do introduce yourself more fully than I have, if you like. Um, <clears throat> basically just telling me telling us about your vision for a good livestock uh, perhaps saying whether you feel that that four scenarios framing makes any sense to you in the current climate um the we've sort of aligned you with the efficiency monogastric future but please please kick back against that um what, what i'm really interested in hearing is your best possible version of the future what evidence you bring to your arguments and what you feel would need to be in place in terms of policies or societal forces um, in order to make that scenario uh, come about. And also, I'm, we're really, really interested to hear because Table is very much about exploring evident values as well as evidence, how your personal life experiences have shaped the views that you hold. Absolutely. Thanks, Tara. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on this um, on this discussion today. So, yeah, I think Tara's introduced me really well. I'm the ABP Chair of Sustainable Beef and Sheep Production at Half Adams University based in Newport, Shropshire. 
I am also an independent livestock sustainability consultant for the other half of my time. And I hold a couple of roles at the Institute for uh, Friendships and Technical Education, um, mainly looking at agriculture and sustainability. And I'm also the treasurer for the National Beef Association. So you can see I've got a, a certain bias there towards beef cattle potentially. And yet I've been um, sort of assigned to the efficiency more meat scenario. Um, and honestly, I'm not necessarily feel personally aligned to that in terms of more meat. I think globally, we may see more meat. I think in this country and in Europe, we may potentially even see less. Um, but on a global basis, we do know that we've got an awful lot of people out there who are at relatively lower incomes who would aspire to have more animal proteins in their diet. So globally, I think we may see more meat in the future, whether that's the ideal or not. Obviously, that's part of the, the um, part of the discussion that we're going to have today. And looking at the four futures, I have to admit, I was really torn because they are exactly the arguments that I hear from lots of different people in lots of different sectors. I think I've heard almost all of those um, those points at some point from somebody. But and and I hate to sound too you know classically academic, but it is complex, isn't it? It isn't a simple. If we just do this, solves the problem. If we just go here, if we just all eat this or don't eat this, you know that solves the way. It is such a complex. Um, conundrum, whether we're talking about livestock just in the UK, in Europe, across the world, whether we're talking about big farms or small farms. I think my main, my main point or my main um, area that I'd like to challenge is that efficiency means necessarily big or intensive or housed or feedlots. Um, because I think that often gets talked about that efficiency and, and in fact, I think this was in the um, gut feelings report, efficiency as a sort of dirty word. And efficiency doesn't just mean intensive housed, fed on corn and soy, you know, 10,000 cattle in a feedlot in Texas. Efficiency for any business, whether in agriculture or outside, just means doing the best that we can with the resources that we've got. And I think that clarification is really important because, for example, and here's some of my evidence um, popping up, we know that on a global basis, we lose over 20% of our animal proteins, so milk, meat and eggs, to diseases for animals that we have cures for or we have treatments but they're simply not implemented because of infrastructure because of conflict because of lack of access lack of electricity etc cetera, etc cetera. we know that for example in areas such as northern australia south africa much of south america only 60 percent of beef cows have a calf every year um, which is an inefficiency loss we know, for example, that if we improved reproduction on um, dairy farms in Kenya, that we could cut the carbon footprint of those farms simply just by doing that with reproduction by 45%. So none of this is about turning a two cow um, subsistence farmer in Kenya into a 10,000 cow housed operation. It's simply about doing everything better. And I think particularly with respect to animal health and welfare, we've got a huge area of improvement across the globe in doing everything on every single farm better. So whether it's two cows or 2,000 cows or 20,000 cows, whether we're talking about pork or, or protein, uh, um, poultry or even aquaculture, if we can do everything better on every single farm with respect for the constraints in terms of resources, in, in terms of the culture, in terms of the market, in terms of the opportunities, including using the tools and technologies available both now and in the future, and, and I think that's particularly important in the low income countries, then I think that would be my best future. So it's a sort of a combination of the efficiency scenario and the livestock on leftovers scenario so making the best use of all of our resources in a way that's appropriate to that system to that farm to that area and in that way what we need to do to achieve that is of course always more difficult and we need more data we need more information we need more um, extension and outreach particularly again in the lower income countries and we've got to be sensitive to the to the 
um, conflicts and to the um, lack of opportunities that we have there sometimes. But we can have a really positive future, I think, if on every farm we do everything better, which could mean more meat, but it would mean with fewer livestock, less land, less water, less fuels, less inputs overall. So it isn't about, for me, efficiency in terms of every cow must be housed for all of its life, for example. It's just about on every farm, let's make this farm the absolute best that it can be and then go from there to improve. Thanks, Jude. And I'm just going to raise a couple of questions now for you not to answer, but to incorporate into the discussion. So one is, um, it, I'd be very keen to hear your thoughts on the, the shift that we're seeing underway globally towards pig and poultry consumption. And also to kind of poke you a little bit more on the question of demand, um, particularly in high income countries. But but for now, um, Varun, perhaps, perhaps you could go next. Same set of questions, really. Um, very interested also in hearing a bit about your your personal values as well and your life experiences that shape shape your views. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank thank you very much for having me as well. I mean, by by way of a bit of a repeat introduction, my name is Varun Deshpande, and I lead the Good Food Institute across Asia. We're a global network of nonprofit organizations focused on advancing the sector of alternative proteins. Um, I grew up here in India, where I am today. I'm speaking to you today from, from Delhi, uh, which is obviously a vastly different environment from the United States or Europe when it comes to meat consumption. Uh, my personal background is in healthcare and public health uh, and global poverty. That's my frame on life. I grew up thinking that I would be, uh, I guess, participating in, the, in healthcare delivery, health tech, um, and kind of the healthcare nonprofit space for the rest of my life. But a few years ago, uh, I got involved uh, deeper and deeper in the nonprofit space, particularly in thinking through how we might address issues of animal welfare and particularly large scale industrial factory farming um, that is concentrated animal feeding operations, et cetera, particularly seeing how the growth of industrialization of animal farming is, also, is already taking place in places like India to, to meet rising demand for animal sourced foods over the next decades. Um, and I think when you examine this question of what do we do about industrial animal farming, uh, we find that it is uh, a central node of, I guess, some of the challenges that we all care about, right? So climate change, global health issues, food insecurity, uh, et cetera, given that we're currently producing or utilizing huge amounts of resources to feed animals in industrialized operations and then eat a portion of those animals as meat, right? And that also results in uh, significant amounts of greenhouse gas emissions and effluents and and all of the things that in fact affect uh, the part of the world in which I grew up, India or the broader global south, uh, is mostly affected more uh, than the rest of the world from these things because we are a vulnerable region. So I think when you, when you examine some of these issues, um, I never thought I would work in this space growing up, but uh, one of the things that seemed really promising at the time was companies that are looking at providing a viable alternative to meat, eggs, and dairy, utilizing technology like food science or biotechnology, uh, particularly to offer, as I said, a viable alternative to industrially farmed meat, eggs, and dairy, right? So the idea is, uh, can we provide a simple switch, not a sacrifice, so that, so that we move away from business as usual? And business as usual right now for the vast majority of meat and seafood that's eaten on this planet is industrially farmed and slaughtered or even, uh, or even fished. Uh, meat and seafood that's eaten on this planet, right? So that's the idea here. Um, as far as, you know, which, which of the futures resonates, uh, naturally I have an affinity then for the use of technology to provide an alternative um, to industrially farm meat. But I do, I do strongly resonate with some of the other visions that have been presented as well, particularly uh, when it comes to working together with the regenerative side. Uh, I think these things are quite complementary, and we, we think at the Good Food Institute that these things are quite complementary to each other. Um, the idea that we'd be able to, I guess, provide high quality, um, regenerative, you know, sort of net um, carbon negative meat, even uh, by sequestering carbon and doing a lot of things that are, that are quite positive for the environment um, is something that we definitely resonate with. So I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion. Uh, but I will say, I mean, you know, we're very early on the, on the alternative protein side insofar as what's possible. We're still scratching the surface uh, insofar as what's needed. Interventions in science and technology in talent pool uh, development, in uh, building a supply chain, 
um, in trade, in regulation, there's a whole lot of interesting opportunities to grow this space. Um, and of course, as we all know, on the plant-based side, there are many products out on the market, but on the other side of the, uh, of the spectrum of alternative proteins, there is also things like cultivated meat and fermentation-derived proteins, which are still yet to, to grow into the market. So that, that's a really exciting area, I think, uh, in terms of what we can do. Um, and just, just to close out here, I think the, the central tenet or the central premise of, uh, you know, of all of this on the alternative protein side is um, the, the demand side nudging has had kind of limited impacts globally over the last decades. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is, is not tell people to eat chickpeas, not chicken, or eat broccoli, not beef, or eat mung beans, not mutton, because that doesn't seem to be working. If you look at countries like India, uh, demand for animal source food seems to increase um, every time there's an increase in, in affluence because particularly meat, but even eggs and dairy are delicious. They bring people together. They're high protein, satiating. They're, they're markers of affluence and aspiration. And so I guess what we're trying to do is uh, something that fits in and provides the sensory and cultural resonance of these foods, uh, but without seeming like a sacrifice. Thanks, Varun. Thanks. Um, so Adele, um, Varun's already um, suggested that he has some sympathy for you. You've been assigned to the regenerative scenario. So over to you. Thank you, Tara. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's really lovely to be here. Um, as Tara said, my, my name's Adele, and I'm Executive Director of the Sustainable Food Trust. Um, the Sustainable Food Trust is a small UK-based charity, but we have an international focus, and our, and our mission is to speed up the transition to more sustainable, regenerative um, food and farming systems across the world. And the particular area um, of you know, the future of stock is, is, in, is a real focus for us. Um, I, uh, yeah, I really um, agree, Tara, with how you framed um, my assignment at the beginning of the of the regenerative future for livestock. Um, off the bat, I wanted to say that as an organisation, we very much um, disagree with intensive livestock production. So um, animals that, that are housed permanently, um, which rely very heavily on the use of fossil fuels to keep those systems running, and of course also feed and other such inputs like um, veterinary medicines as well. So we really believe that those sorts of livestock systems need to be phased out. And of course, by doing that, I think you will globally reduce the, the total amount of meat that's consumed uh, across the world. But we do feel that, that livestock um, and particularly ruminant livestock have a really, really important role to play um, in the future of farming. And that's particularly in the recycling of nutrients and the rebuilding of soil fertility, um, be it on permanent pasture or um, by introducing um, rotations back into farming systems. Uh, so a return in many, in many cases to, to more mixed farming using herbal lays and grazing livestock to rebuild that soil fertility naturally thus reducing our dependence again on external inputs like nitrogen fertilizer, which in themselves have a very high impact. So, so we really feel often it's described, and I think in the gut feeling report, this, this scenario is described as, as less and better, which in principle is what we're saying. Um, from a consumer perspective, I really think we need to be telling people what they can do rather than what they shouldn't be doing. And so we, we really tend to focus on, okay, what, you know, what, what can citizens do um, if they want to continue me eating meat, if they don't, uh, for ethical reasons, uh, want to stop eating meat? What can they do? What can they look for? Rather than you shouldn't do this, you need to reduce the amount of this that you're eating. So we really try and focus on that, that, positive, that positive message. Um, the other quick point I wanted to, to pick up on, because I'm sure we can dive into, into some of what we're talking about with mixed farming later on, um, but in the in the gut feeling report, um, just for everyone who hasn't hasn't read it, um, the scenario that I was assigned to ends by saying that um, uh, you know we would move towards this more regenerative um, farming system where animals are actually grazed outside, um, and that would be great until the demand for that product again became too big, and we would then have to switch back to intensive livestock systems to keep up with the demand for everyone wanting to eat meat. Um, and thus we would kind of end up back where we started. Um, I, I think the fundamental thing that's wrong with that assumption is that um, we need to take companies with us on this journey. 
Um, a lot of companies, multinational companies in particular around the world, are sourcing um, livestock products from very intensive systems. We need to help them shift to this regenerative agriculture future. And I think if we can do that, we can manage the demand side. Um, but it's a, it's a big undertaking. Um, there's a huge amount that needs to change. And I think many, many companies now are, are, for example, setting net zero targets. I think really they're thinking about tweaking the existing system rather than fundamentally um, kind of totally reforming the way that, that we produce food and in this case, livestock products. So basically, you know, in summary, we feel um, grass fed livestock have a really, really important role to play in the, in the future of our farming systems, particularly by recycling nutrients and rebuilding soil fertility. Um, so I'll end there because I'm sure there's much more we can dig into later. Thanks. Thanks, Adele. Um, I should just emphasize that in every single one of the scenarios, they all went went wrong. So it was not just <laughs> yeah. yours. Um, but um, what's interesting, this this idea of uh, we should be uh, shouldn't be telling people what they can't do, but more what they can. That, that seems to resonate with all three of you so far. So um, over to you, Ian, to see to see how far you agree and, and what your take is on it all. Right, okay. Well, I've been in agriculture actually for almost 50 years. I started on a conventional <clears throat> dairy farm and I was really quite young in my early 20s. I spent four years there. That really woke me up to the horrors of what in those days was really quite an intensive farm, 160 cows producing huge amounts of milk, primarily based on nitrogen, cake and diesel, um, which took me down a completely different route. I became vegetarian at that point and later on I became a vegan. So I've actually been vegetarian for most of my working life. I've been on this farm for over 30 years and we've developed a system which is really fairly unique. And I suppose the scenario I've present, been presented with is perhaps one of the most extreme of the four, but it also happens to be the one which probably almost nobody knows anything very much about, unless they particularly personally know me. I am well known in the organic world. I've been part of the organic world for, for five, almost five decades. Um, our farm is also very much the centre of attention. We get a huge number of visitors from literally all over the world who want to see how we can possibly grow vegetables on poor quality land without the use of livestock inputs. There's a general consensus, I think, most of us would probably agree that there is a definite move towards reduction of meat consumption across the planet. I think we, we know the reasons why we don't need to be discussing that, particularly at this very point. We will later, I'm sure. And it's really easy to get people to understand this. And people I do know do understand this, but it's rather like trying to get people to change their habits is incredibly difficult. You know, we've tried to do this with people in their cars. It hasn't worked. We tried to do this you know, with, with other areas of, of lifestyle choices as well. And it's really difficult. People do not want to be told what to do. So I think the point that Dale was making is a really important one. I think we need to be a lot more sympathetic towards people making changes. So I mostly agree with the scenario I've been presented. However, I would say that there's always going to be livestock on farms. It will be a, a much reduced number of livestock, in fact, dramatically reduced number of livestock. And I'm very much about presenting a plant-based agriculture, which we've managed to do really well on our farm. We have some really good results of this. And I suppose looking longer term, the, the best version of what I would like to see, I suppose that the dream really, if you like to call it that, would be <clears throat> an increase in people's fruit and vegetable consumption. Uh, I think this is pretty well accepted. We have a really bad diet in this country. We have one of the worst cultural food diets anywhere in the world. You know, we, we, we really are really bad at it. If we were to double fruit and vegetable consumption in UK, and if we were to grow most of that fruit and vegetable consumption, it would still only take up 1% of our available farmland. We still have a huge amount of farmland left. If we would decrease the cereal area by, by 50%, in, in, in order to reduce livestock numbers, we have to decrease cereal numbers, cereal acreage, producing more pulse crops, more bean crops. These are much better for people's diets, take up far less energy, fits in really well with agricultural rotations. It would then give us the ability to increase woodland from the present 10% up to 25 or possibly 30%. And we all know what carbon benefits in the long term that would have. We could establish energy crops. We have a serious problem in the UK with lack of natural energy. Energy crops could be a really important part of the farming landscape. And we also will have huge areas of land for rewilding. So reduction in meat 
consumption in the UK would have a dramatic effect on the countryside, producing healthier food, a much cleaner environment, a dramatic reduction in carbon usage, cleaner air, and also more farmers. This will put more farmers back on the land. We're not in the business of putting farms up out of work. We really want to see more farms get back on the land. And this would increase the number of people on the land. We know there are a lot of people who would love to be involved in farming and are not able to, A, because they don't have access to land, or B, because they don't have the knowledge or the skills. The, the whole restoration of biodiversity would come as a part of that. And we, we hear so many stories about the loss of biodiversity, the insect populations crashed. Reinstating this would have a huge benefit in terms of biodiversity. And farms would also be much more self-sufficient in fertility. At the moment, the majority of farms are dependent either on massive inputs of nitrogen and other fertilizers at great environmental and energy cost, or at the cost of other people's land in the terms of in the form of imported acres coming in from other farmland where perhaps manure is in excess. The evidence for this really, I suppose, the primary evidence is, is my own farm. I've been working on, on this particular farm for over 35 years. We've taken some very poor quality land, which was originally long-term pasture. We've turned it into a, a very productive vegetable unit, producing food of very high value. And we've been able to compare this with a neighboring farm, same soil type in permanent pasture. And we know that our system is sustainable, particularly in terms of carbon, where we've actually managed to increase our carbon content over and above that of our neighbor. The general idea that plant-based agriculture could never ever possibly support itself in terms of carbon retention or carbon improvement is actually one which I think is probably untrue. So how would we possibly implement this utopia that I would like to think about? Well, firstly, we, we need to bring farmers along. We have to really encourage farmers. We need to give support to farmers. I mean, farmers have always enjoyed enormous amount of support for many, many generations. That support needs to be diverted into a way which encourages farmers to maintain their farms, to reduce their livestock, to get into this much more diverse agricultural landscape, which I'm talking about. And if we really want a good example of what this would look like, and I'm, I'm really amazed at how people have completely forgotten about what happened to the UK during the, the Second World War. It's been completely, almost completely ignored. During that time, we had a situation where UK was under extreme food threat in the same way we are now. In fact, the threat then is perhaps probably much less than the global threat we're facing at the moment. Yet people were really, public were really complicit in doing what was expected of them in terms of changing their diet, modifying their diet, they had to because food was rationed, nobody complained, everybody went along with it. Farmers were encouraged into a completely different form of agriculture, livestock numbers were dramatically reduced, areas of fruit and vegetable were increased, pulses and, and vegetable cereal crops were all increased, and arguably our population has never had a better diet than it did during that brief wartime period. As soon as the war ended, we all went back to our rather poor grubby eating habits, uh, and that has continued to this day. The consumption of fruit and vegetables in UK is dropping at 1% a year. We have a serious food cultural problem here. That's it. I'm on mute. Sorry, Ian, I, I, was, um, I was about to interject. Have you, is you finished or did you um, want- Sorry, it went on too long. <laughs> no, it was, I mean, I think that's, that's quite a that is quite a different vision from some of the other ones that I'm hearing and I'm I'm just hearing a kind of I have a bundle of thoughts there I mean I think one is um one is that you've all you've all presented your visions I think nobody has mentioned apart from Ian the the health dimension of more meat less meat different meat alternative to meat um I think I think it'd be really interesting to get your reflections on that what I also hear is that each of you has some sympathy with one of the other scenarios in to a certain extent they they need one another to kind of prop one another up to a certain extent so I'm hearing quite a lot of, of sort of synergies <laughs> What I haven't heard um, is we've talked a lot about efficiency, but we need to perhaps all define that um, and perhaps acknowledge that there are a million different interpretations of what that might mean. And then finally, um, Ian has 
has been talking about the release of land to nature, woodland restoration, using less land, needing less land. Adele has been talking about um, more circularity of systems and more regenerative visions where a greater biodiversity is implicit in that. Varun has also um, sort of talked about this release of land to nature. And I think you've been doing that as well, Jude, through, through your focus on animal health and all the rest of it. So perhaps if you could weave in the biodiversity dimension and your understandings of biodiversity, that would all be brilliant. And I don't mind who goes first. <laughs> Who'd like to pitch in? Well, I will then if no one else is going to. <laughs> um, I mean, there's one there's one area which nobody really covered, and I, I probably didn't mention it enough, and that's about soil. We talk about efficiency. I mean, what nobody really seems to have woken up to is the efficiency factor of the soil. When we get the soil right, it's incredibly efficient. And this is really about biodiversity. So biodiversity starts below the ground. It starts in the soil. Once we really encourage that biodiversity, we can get really good crop growth without resorting to lots of inputs, and that generates above ground biodiversity. So the soil is really where we need to be looking and thinking really hard because this really does hold the key to opening up possibilities for, you know, really long-term, proper, sustainable, I know it's a terrible word because it's overused, but sustainable use of land in the sense that we can still feed enough people in the process of, of restoring that land. I, t I totally agree with Ian. I think I think soil has to be at the heart of these solutions. Um, and and Tara, your set of questions sort of te teed me up quite nicely to do, to um, to describe what we feel is regenerative agriculture. And we don't we we just sort of shy away of trying to define that because obviously there's lots of different terms you could use: regenerative, agroecology, climate smart, nature friendly organic but I don't know you know there's, there's so many different terms you can use and actually I, th I think ultimately that the, it's the same principles which which underpin them so the three principles we feel underpin sustainable regenerative agriculture or should do is farming in harmony with nature so farming in a way where biodiversity can operate as you know, food production and biodiversity one and indivisible rather than food production here and nature over here of course there's some areas of land where you know it will be most efficient to to um to turn that over to nature um some of some of the kind of more um uh sort of very extensive areas of uplands um and and uh, wetland areas um heath moors and those sorts of things of course that those those are perfectly suited to for, for for just nature but i think most areas can can produce food with nature uh, as acting as kind of one and indivisible rather than separation um the second is the the second principle we believe is the circular economy so recycling of nutrients trying to create more of a closed loop system for farming so relying less on external inputs more on the recycling of of nutrients to produce food in a, in a lower impact way um, and thirdly the the principle of positive health um, be it the plants and animals and of course the people working on the landscape um, and of course also the people that eat the food so um, so grass-based livestock grass-based meat and dairy products um, have have been found to have very beneficial health impacts when you look at the the ratios of um, omega-3 to 6 fatty acids um, which my esteemed colleagues are far more expert in than I am um, but but we have seen that um, grass-based versus grain-based, um, the grass-based systems uh, do produce much more healthy and nutritious food. So, um, so that's the direction we feel we should be going. Thank, thanks. Uh, Varun, perhaps you could, um, and, and also and also Jude, Jude this, this idea of health, um, because obviously one of the central accusations that's often made about these sort of plant-based alternative proteins is that they're ultra-processed foods, they're not very healthy, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and then so and then for you, Jude, um, this idea that if we had a sort of business as usual, I mean, I do I do get that you also have quite a lot of sympathy with with Adele's way forward, but but that just more of the same old, same old, we can't tell people what to eat, what would be the implications of that for for health? But but Varun, why don't why don't you go first? 
Yeah, so the, the question of health is, is an interesting one. I mean, I think the first thing that we do have to grapple with is quite outside of the personal health question, we also have to grapple with the public health question. And certainly the issues of zoonotic disease and antimicrobial resistance, et cetera, are very relevant to the public health question. It is worth noting that the current sort of business as usual as we've been discussing, which is industrialized animal farming does have significant challenges on that front. And I mean, this is something that's been studied and I understand that the chain on antimicrobial resistance is complex, et cetera, but pretty much every organization that has studied this has identified um, industrialized animal farming, the concentration and, and increase in demand for animal meat and the attended sort of deforestation, uh, disturbing of wildlife ecosystems, et cetera, uh, as well as the actual evolution of strains um, of zoonotic diseases on the farms themselves uh, and the factory farms themselves as being a major reason for zoonotic disease outbreak, et cetera, right? So I think that that's one thing that uh, we do have to grapple with. Um, on the personal health question, I think it is really important for us to, I think, question kind of what what people are eating and what's going into their body, for people to question rather what, what they're eating and what's going into their bodies. It is also worth asking the question, however, healthier than what, right? Because um, a significant portion of the idea behind a plant-based burger, which is which is significantly processed, is to replace a beef burger, which is also significantly processed, right? So some of the questions that, that people ask about sort of sodium content, et cetera, in some of these products, when you match them with um, a conventional beef burger, uh, they tend to have very similar amounts of sodium once, once those beef burgers have had salt, et cetera, added to them. So I think that's, that's one thing to note. Um, I think also when you look at some of these, at least the products that are out on the market, by default, they don't contain cholesterol. They don't have any of the, the animal fats, et cetera. And I know that the, the consensus around some of this is um, a bit complex. However, we do know that if we're talking about a Western diet where cardiovascular disease and a number of other issues are of significant concern, then cholesterol, animal lipid consumption, et cetera, are things that, we, that should be watched out for. So you, we're starting to see now in response to this question more and more sort of Stanford Medical School does a swap meat study where they put in a Beyond Meat burger instead of the, the conventional beef burger that people are eating. And they find, obviously, this is sort of almost fait accompli, right? You can tell prima facie that this is going to happen. Um, you know, the, the blood lipid profile and the cardiovascular markers improve vastly because you're taking something that contains cholesterol and animal fats, et cetera, out and replacing it some, with something that's made from plant-based ingredients. So I think all fair points on the on the personal health question, uh, but then just one last final thing to address here: um, the the improvement cycle or the iterative cycle on on these products is quite quick. So whereas we're seeing you know an industry or a, I guess a landscape, the 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 all protein landscape that is highly reliant on ingredients that have been optimized for some other purpose decades ago, uh, you know that were coming in from the edible oil industry or for other things. Um, limited by those ingredients and therefore you have to add in a bunch of other stuff like an emulsifier and a number of things that people maybe don't want to eat. Um, we're seeing vast improvements very quickly. So I think the food science approach allows us to go from 14 ingredients to 11 ingredients quickly because now you have ingredients that are more optimized for this purpose, right? So through breeding techniques or whatever may be the case, uh, we're now seeing companies that are on the ingredient side. So in, in places like India, we're seeing companies utilizing India's agricultural biodiversity, the inclusion of chickpeas and, and other legumes and pulses and millets and, and other crops that have different functionalities. I'm not a food scientist, I only play one on TV, but um, what I would say is if we're making a plant-based egg substitute, um, really what, what you need is the specific type of crop, let's say mung bean or chickpea that has all the functionality that an egg currently provides so that consumers can feel like it's a simple switch, not a sacrifice. And, if we're utilizing soy inputs or other things that just because those are commodity crops that have been around for a long time, you won't get those functionalities by default. You'll have to add a bunch of stuff in, which is what leads to the ultra processed claim, right? So i um, really happy to, um, to share more on any of this stuff, but essentially the, the, the improvement cycle, the iterative cycle in this food science led space is quite rapid and we expect that it'll continue to be so. Thank, thanks, Vern. And, and I would love to bring Ian into, because I haven't heard your views on this alternative future. But before I do that, just get on to, to Ju to come back on this question of health. So two points, really. 
Um, yeah, absolutely on the health. I think there is no doubt that all of us, and I mean across the world, not just us in the Western world, I think there is no doubt that we could all all eat better diets. I feel very virtuous because I do eat my five or six fruit and veg per day, but there are an awful lot of people who don't. And I utterly agree with Ian that we could do everything we can to promote that in everybody's diet, regardless of their protein sources. Everybody should be eating more fruit and veg and having a more balanced diet. And again, I think that's the key. I think that's why the more meat at any cost sort of um, scenario doesn't really resonate with me because I don't advocate for three T-bones every meal. You know, I don't think that's the way forward. I think the way forward is for people to have a balanced diet, incorporating meat or fish or alternatives, whatever their wish is, but to have that balanced diet fundamentally. And there's an awful lot of work in the, in the UK at the moment about taking that less but better approach. How much less that is, is obviously open to debate. Is it one gram less or only eating meat once a year? You know, there's, um, there's a huge range, but that less but better, um, I think can give us huge opportunities. Um, and I think it's really good that on the plant based alternative side, um, that the question of the number of, of ingredients is being addressed, because I do hear that as a concern for consumers where they see a beef burger that has ingredients of meat and perhaps a bit of salt or preservative or something. And then and they go, but this one has 23 ingredients. You know, that is a concern. Um, and we can have a balanced diet incorporating almost any lifestyle. I mean, Let's face it, potato chips are vegetarian, vegan. You know, if we ate potato chips all day, we would all have huge health consequences. And there is a there's a clear role of animal source foods in the diet in terms of essential fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, proteins for some of the poorest in the world. And we know that, for example, in some regions of the world, in the lower income countries, up to 60 percent of infants between the age of six and 18 months aren't getting the amount of milk, meat and eggs that could that are recommended by the World Health Organization. So it isn't about pushing more and more and more meat, it's making sure that everybody has that balanced diet. And then finally, just to come on to the biodiversity question, because I think this was is incredibly important. And Ian's absolutely right that we have seen a decrease in farmland birds, for example. Um, but again, it's about that ecosystem balance. And, and if we take the approach and, sometimes a bit of a dodgy one but if we take the approach that we should be going back to nature as it was you know 100 years ago 200 years ago 500 years ago there is a balance between grazing livestock for example and other um plants and animals at, as well and just to give an example and i think it was referred to in the chat um there are areas of northern scotland where there's an awful lot of peatlands and some of the birds have been lost from those areas not because of grazing livestock because they've taken away the grazing livestock and therefore the grass isn't um short enough to allow those birds to nest so we often have a sort of rose tinted view that if we just take away all the livestock everything will be good it'll be fine but actually from a biodiversity point of view they play a really really important role um, and particularly with gra with grazing livestock we know that grazing livestock give out produce i should say more human edible protein in terms of milk and meat than they ever take in in terms of the feed that they consume so we do have this really complex system here and i think we do all of us including me um tend to through our own experiences and biases try to make it a very simple system and it is it is incredibly complex thanks jude um <clears throat> ian I'm, i mean i'd like to just bring you in on your thoughts around health and, and it also speaks to one of the questions which which is sort of why don't we just eat the whole unprocessed mung bean or whatever it might be um, rather than eat it um, packaged up into into a processed food um, and I'd also like to squeeze in one more question before we move to the Q&A session so um, Ian, if you could be reasonably brief if you could and then I just want to bring in one more question and then we'll move to the Q&A. Oh yeah, well on the health issues, I think it's pretty clear that a less processed, <clears throat> more whole food diet is definitely better for people's health. I don't think any of us here would probably argue about that. And when we're talking about balance, we need to also balance what the land is capable of, what, what agricultural systems are capable of, 
matched against what people need to be eating. I think that's a critical factor. At the moment we've been, you know, in UK we're importing over 50% of our food comes from somewhere else. This is a ridiculous amount. I mean, we could, in theory, we could be almost completely self-sufficient. And it's not about turning the clock back. I'm not looking at some rural Israel, which is 150, 200 years old, because we've, we've seen huge changes in agriculture many times before. So we can change, we can change this. And the change is not just good for people's physical health. I think, you know, look at farming community. There's a lot of serious mental health issues going on because of the stress that farmers are under, particularly livestock farmers who feel particularly in a difficult position right now. And I think we need to, you know, honour those people and the work they do. And they need real support in order to, A, to improve their mental health and, B, move into a system which is much more sustainable, not just for them, but for the environment as a whole. I think this is really the health issue as much as anything. It's not just a physical one. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Varun, you've got your hand, hand up there. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so I, I wholeheartedly agree with what, with what Ian just said. I think, we, I guess the issue is, and there was a comment in the chat right now as well, which put this really well. The issue is vegetables do not seem to be competing against meat on the plate, right? And I think, I think what people need to be eating has never seemed to actually drive what people eat. Um, I think we all agree what people need to be eating. And, you know, I mean, I, I would myself prefer not to eat a processed plant-based meat for every meal. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I think if, if, if the, I guess if the, if the default option is a processed animal meat option, which also happens to be having a significant impact on the planet, because again, most of this, most of this animal meat is not coming from regenerative farms, but rather from factory farming systems, even in places like India already, um, that's the major challenge that we're looking to address. And right? if we all agree that we are in fact in some sort of climate emergency, if we agree that we need to sort of stay within planetary health boundaries, if we agree that we need to aim for a 1.5 degree Celsius world, um, then we need to get less extractive, provide viable alternatives that are actually attractive to human beings, um, and then kind of uh, see where we can land on, on all the other stuff. But that, that's kind of the, the future that we're envisioning. Thank you, thank you, Varun. Um so, so my sort of last question before we move over to the, the Q&A is about power. So, um, and again, listening to some of the criticisms that, that are out there, um, Varun, I think a lot of the concerns about alternative proteins is that um, if they have sort of cultural power in that, yes, they substitute for uh, low quality, you know, beef burgers and sausages and all the rest of it, but the, the, the risk is that they, they lock us in to assuming that this is what normal food is, as well as the actual corporate power and the fact that very large corporations are also investing in these alternative proteins, which is a success from one perspective or same old, same old from another. So that's a question for you about power. I mean, I think for you, Jude, um, again, I've, I've, we have assigned you to a scenario that you don't necessarily uh, hold with, but but to an extent, efficiencies, um, there is a sort of efficiencies of scale that people um, talk about and, and fear um, as well as embrace. Um, Adele, I mean, I think you are very much um, in the sort of the little guys sort of camp, and I would say you are too, Ian. Um, so I feel what what is it about the sort of bigger is better that you that you feel has a point as well as what you really kick back against. Yeah, I think it's 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 a fine balance. And I think there are bigger farms, be it bigger acreages or or bigger herds, um, that that are producing food in a very climate friendly, nature friendly way. So I don't I don't necessarily think we need to we need to just be focusing on on small farms, although we do we do feel that they're you know, very much at the heart of this solution, particularly as the majority of farms around the world are smallholders. Um, so I think they, they sit really at the heart of this. Um, but I, I do think there's opportunity for larger farms to be part of the solution as well. And um, I think, as, as you were saying, Tara, the, the, the big companies and the, the efficiencies of scale are obviously going to be a part of this as well. And as I said at the beginning, um, I think we need to, you know, our, our role really is to hold hold them to account um, and if they're not going to if they're not going to be fully transparent and start offering um, financial incentives to those farmers who are you know, doing the right thing or moving towards a, a more sustainable system um, then they should be called out and we can't we can't accept greenwashing um, in the in this whole journey whether it be 
for livestock products or for for the alternative proteins as well. I think they're both part of this. Plants and animals can both be very much part of the solution and both be very much part of the problem. So um, so I just think we we've got a role to hold these these companies to account. Um, but but in my mind, they they have to be part of this solution if we're going to feed um, a growing population. Um, one thing we haven't touched upon is, is waste um, as part of this discussion as well. Obviously, that's a huge, huge issue at the moment. Um, and obviously, when, when people talk about needing to produce more calories, um, I would argue that you know we are producing enough calories. Um, we need to, we need to um, stop wasting so much. And, and when it comes to eating livestock, that means eating the whole animal no, nose to tail, which is something we're uh, we're not very good at at the moment. Um, and we, uh, we need to we need to kind of bring that back into social norm. Um, thinking about how how we make the most of all these livestock products. Um, and I find it crazy that, for example, we're um, burning more fats around the back of abattoirs at the moment because there's no demand for them. When actually animal fats uh, are equally as good. Um, as plant fats, palm oil, um, soy, uh, rapeseed oil, uh, at going into you know more more processed products because of course there's always going to be an element of processing. We should be using the fat of our own land landscape rather than fat of the Indonesian rainforest in in producing these foods. Um, so I think that's that's a really important point as well. Thank, thanks, Adele. And just to plug, we we held an event on fats um, uh, a while back, which we can send the link to. Um, once it's up um just if you if you could all um Varun, if you could get back on the power thing and then uh, briefly if possible yeah i think i think it's a great point i think so so we specifically focus on the the kind of protein transition question but we obviously recognize that the issue here is um you know e even if we say or one of the issues here is that even if we say look here's orders of magnitude improvements vis-a-vis factory farming when it comes to land use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions, and all the attended sort of deforestation, ocean dead zones, ocean acidification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we still have this underlying issue of concentration of power and kind of um, what is essentially a oligopoly of firms, right? I think that that makes a lot of sense. It also has, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking, I, I think primarily maybe from a UK standpoint in terms of topography and and not necessary and, and sort of large farms also using regenerative practices that is simply not the case in other parts of the world right so if we're looking at encroachment of the amazon etc that's all happening you know even with grazing animals um, you know in addition to in addition in addition to growing crops it's also pasture land that's that that's that's currently being that the amazon rainforest is being cleared for right so that that's something that is worth noting um however we're sort of take, we're taking a bit of a pragmatic view on that i think um, given that these these companies, these large meat companies and large food companies are already rather entrenched, um, while we would love to continue working with several folks on the regenerative side, uh, including small farms and, and, and folks in the kind of farmer aggregation space and farmer, I guess, transition space to more regenerative practices as an essential complement to our work, which once again, I think is very important. We're taking a kind of pragmatic lens on the fact that you know, unfortunately, it is what it is in terms of the, the entrenchment of these large organizations, these large corporations. Um, we are in a bit of an emergency. Uh, we'd love to help the world transition as fast as possible to something that is orders of magnitude less impactful. That's why we're, we're focusing on kind of large corporate partners in getting them to move over to alternative proteins as well. But it certainly is a valid point. <laughs> it's something that I think about all the time. It just doesn't seem to be something that, that I see uh, a way out of right now. Mm -hmm. To, to, does either of you, Jude or Ian, have anything you want to add or comment on there? Yeah, this is a, a really valid topic of the whole business of who controls the food system, I think is a really difficult one. And, you know, even in UK, where we seem to think everything's fair and socially good, it's not. I mean, farmers are being ripped off and controlled by large multi organizations and have done for many, many years. And this is one of the reasons our food culture is so bad. And this is one of the reasons why the people who buy the food have been steered towards a particular line of products which suit large scale industrialization and this is a really serious problem not just in uk but across the world i mean farmers are not in control of their own 
destiny at all. And I think we need to get that control back to farmers. And one of the interesting questions I get asked very often when we get visited to our farm is, okay, this looks great. You know, you've got 20 acres of wonderful crops, but how could this possibly be scaled up? Technically, yes, it could be scaled up, but socially and culturally, we need to think how that's going to work because we need to include the social and cultural dynamics of people if we're going to make this work properly and really put food back in control of the people that are producing it. I think this is the most important point because leaving it to the multinational corporation means that we get a completely messed up environment. We've seen it happening and it's continuing to happen. And this is why agriculture, I think, is in such a bad state because of the control which has been put upon it. Thanks. Jude. I'm afraid I'm not going to add a dissenting voice. I, I completely agree with Ian. And if I had my ideal world, you know, farmers would have much more control. Um, we have considerable demands being placed almost every day. Things can change on a day by day basis, depending on, you know, grocery store X says, ah, oh, we're only take, going to take cattle that are being given Y, or we are going to in implement X, Y, and Z. So yeah, farmers have lost an awful lot of autonomy on a, um, on a global basis. And we really need to put that, um, put that to right, regardless of which farming system we're talking about. Thank you. Um, I have been trying to incorporate some of the questions as we go along. I'm aware we're running out of actual Q&A time, but there is there is a bundle of questions which points out that one of the main stakeholders in this whole debate um, has so far not been talked about at all, and that's the animal itself. Um, could, um, could some of you comment on the sort of the animal ethics, animal welfare dimensions of your anticipated visions? So given that I'm not necessarily pro, you know, more, more, more me, I am pro efficiency in terms of treating that animal better in terms of optimal health and welfare. And I, I if even if nothing else, I'd like to make it really clear that I don't see efficiency and welfare or efficiency in animal health as um, diametrically opposed. I think any efficient livestock system also has to have optimum animal health and welfare, because if it doesn't, and let's say, you know, 10% of animals die when they shouldn't, that's not an efficient system. So whether you've got two cows or 20 cows or 2000 cows, those animals should have optimum health and welfare in that system in order for it to be efficient. So they're not diametrically opposed. And your vision of welfare does not necessarily go hand in hand with the expectation that cows have to be in fields. I, mean, I think it has to be the best management. So to give an anecdotal example, I know of a farm where they were building some new housing. So the cattle had to be um, outside for far longer than they normally would be. And they had far greater issues with mastitis, which, it, which is an infection of the udder, and also of lameness because that particular farm couldn't support having those animals grazing for nine months of the year of the year rather than six. So it's really important that all animals have access to systems that allow them to express their natural behaviors, but we've got to allow for the fact that not all grazing is sunny and happy and perfect and beautiful. And if you're a cow outside on a day and it's throwing it down with rain and it's freezing cold and the ground's really, really damp, that, that isn't a better environment than a warm, dry, um, bedded yard for example. I think it's really important that we look at the science and look at the evidence and look at what the behaviour of animals tells us. And in the rain, you'll see um, cattle queuing up to come inside because the cold's wet, just as we were. And so we've got to look at that behaviour and look at the evidence and look at the science and look at the work of people like Temple Grandin, rather than sort of taking the anthropomorphic view on it, which we all tend to do because we all put ourselves in the animal's place, understandably. Yeah. Varun, you have, your, you have your hand up. Oh, that may have been an error, but uh, I, do, I, do have a, I do have a point of view here, which is, um, so I guess the unfortunate truth is that, you know, the, the analyses that we've seen indicate that with rising populations, rising incomes, and the, and the demand for meat being what it is, we're looking at anywhere between 62% to 252% or 242% more meat by 2050, primarily driven by places like South Asia, Southeast Asia, eventually even Sub-Saharan Africa as incomes continue to rise. And then the sort of inevitable consequences are of that, a supply chain that simply does not treat animals well. 
right? So we are looking at factory farming. And I think we at the Good Food Institute don't really touch the animal welfare angle as much because we find it, we find it can be rather polarizing. But, you know, I mean, the, the way that animals are treated, speaking personally, I do believe it's a bit of a moral travesty in, in the kind of concentrated animal feeding operation space. It is, it is really, um, if you look at gestation crates, if you look at chickens, the way that they're fed, if you, look, if, if you drive down the street in Delhi or Mumbai and you see one of those wire mesh trucks driving past you with chickens kind of stacked three stories high inside a truck um, and, you know, feces dripping on them and the kind of very many people, especially during the pandemic, when there was also outbreaks of avian flu and an increased sort of heightened sense of alarm around zoonotic disease, very many people, of course, in the top socioeconomic strata, but, but still very many people did question where their food was coming from in ways that they didn't before. And then when you talk to, you know, I guess now that, now that the pandemic is over, if you talk to any of the folks in, in the meat industry, they will tell you that consumption just bounced back immediately like that. It didn't change anything. I mean, like providing a viable alternative, we believe has to be the future because otherwise there is no option but to continue with this absolutely, um, trying not to say insane, but absolutely unconscionable sort of moral travesty that we have going on in, in the factory farming ecosystem when it comes to animals. So that's that's my personal view and I guess uh, interspersed with the, with the Good Food Institute's view globally. Thank you. Uh, I have a feeling that Ian and Adele aren't going to disagree that dramatically. So, could, no. I, could I just make one very brief point? We talk about animal welfare, but we talk about it from the point of view of our own consciences rather than from the animal welfare itself. To give you an example, when I was in dairy nearly 50 years ago, the average lactation lifespan of cows then was seven lactations. Now it's down to less than three. Yet we have the highest welfare standards of any country, probably anywhere in the world. And supposedly we're looking after our animals. Something's gone seriously wrong if animals are only able to milk for three lactations and then they're finished. So I think the animal welfare issue is still something which is really important to people. Uh, and I think it's one of the prime movers of cultural food changes in the UK. Thank you. Um, I think the other thing that we haven't talked about, and again, it's come up in the chat as one of the questions, um, is we are in a cost of living crisis right now and affordability is is obviously at the front of everybody's mind um i think the charge is that both the sort of the less and better scenario that that you would argue for adele means that it it, it de facto it ends up as less for quite a lot of people and better for for the lucky few and varun again i go to my local supermarket and at the moment the cost of the uh, alternatives. I mean, it's really expensive. So, um, yes, um, perhaps some comments on on affordability. Um, I'm happy to, to to jump in first on this. Um, I think there's two there's two issues in in your in your question, Tara. There's there's access to everyone having the right to have access to healthy and nutritious food, and then there's the fact that our kind of economic system around food farming um, and other such products uh, are, is totally distorted, i.e. The, 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 the worst food um, from the most intensive systems that are the worst for our health and the environment are currently the cheapest things for people to buy. And so those, um, those particularly on low incomes, are eating, um, eating food which is making them more sick uh, and, and degrading the environment at the same time. And that's, that's just completely insane. The more you, the more you look into um, true cost accounting and, and externalities, the more you realize that our, our economic system surrounding food is so messed up uh, and how much um, all countries around the world are spending on healthcare um, and treating people with diet related ill health, as opposed to how much they're spending on helping farmers transition to, to more sustainable regenerative production systems is again completely out of kilter. So I think if we can start valuing um, positive environmental outcomes and positive health outcomes and, and make sure that those food products become more accessible uh, and, the, and the food products which are making us all unwell and degrading the environment become become more expensive. I think eventually the, the price points will start leveling out. Um, but until that point, we need to make sure that that everyone has access to this to this better food. Um, and I think that's where the government needs to step in and play a role. 
Um, I think there's there's plenty of solutions out there that have been proposed. Um, I'll give one quite sort of niche example, which is a is is a scheme they have in in the states where in the US they give out food stamps to to people on low incomes. Mm, sort of, I, th I think there's positive and negatives surrounding that, but. Um, in um, in Washington D.C., for example, they they give out food stamps to to people below a certain in income threshold. Uh, the scheme is called Double Up Double Up Food Bucks, uh, and the food stamps basically are worth twice as much if you spend them in the farmers market um, than if you spend spend them in the supermarket. So you know that that's quite a sort of niche example, and I, I think it's unrealistic to think everyone will go and shop at farmers markets. But I do think there's in innovative mechanisms we can introduce which which start leveling this uh, discrepancy we have in society. Um, one other quick point which relates to what we were talking about just now is I think we need to give start giving citizens better information um, about about their food um, and so um, in the UK there's a group called clear uh, which is working towards standardized definitions of things like grass-fed outdoor reared um, etc but also um, making sure that any future so-called eco labels are underpinned by com common metrics um, and so I think if we can give people more information on the climate impact the nature impact and the health and well-being impact of any food product that they buy be it fresh produce or something that which has been processed they can start thinking about those different decisions um, and of course that's still impact by impacted by price but I think we need to we need to um, give people better information um, and stop kind of this this crazy confusion of, um, of the media polarizing the debate at the moment, uh, start measuring outcomes and start telling people the impact, the true impact of, uh, of food and farm farming systems around the world. Yes. Uh, Varun, perhaps you could come back on the cost of living issue. Yeah, thank you so much. So I, I'll speak more directly Tara, to, the, to the cost of alternative protein specifically. Um, I think, you know, this is an area that ultimately the theory of change simply has to be uh, taste the same or better, cost the same or less, uh, and is accessible and, and, and available everywhere in terms of driving market adoption, right? Like that, that's really what people have been focusing on up until now as well. Um, I think we need to go one step further normatively and also make sure that the products themselves are getting healthier and healthier all the time, crowding in as much nutrition as possible. Um, accessible in formats that make sense um, to, to global south environments, um, but ultimately what's been, what the focus has been thus far has been providing burgers, which are alternatives for, um, you know, sort of, once again, uh, the burgers that people are eating every day in the West. Um, some of the stuff that we've been doing in places like India has been really interesting, which has been, uh, as far as kind of cost competitiveness is concerned, that seems to be the, the key Kind of tipping point that will drive mass adoption of any of these of any of these food products, uh, whether it's you know organic eggs or alternative proteins, um, is cost competitiveness, right? So some of the things we need to do are localize the supply chains for these products. I mean, it is um, it, it makes no sense that a significant number of the value added ingredients for these products are actually imported into India, which is such a which is a country with a massive agricultural base and then turned into these end products and then sold in the local market, which obviously prices most of the, the population out of being able to buy them, right? So we need to localize the supply chain. We need to make sure that knowledge sharing is happening across countries on how to formulate these products and manufacture these products. Um, that trade is happening in ways that are not kind of impeded. Um, we need to make sure that we're investing in the, in the value chain, in talent pools. Uh, and then I think critically on, the, on the, the issue at the intersection of taste, nutrition, as well as cost, we do need to continue investing in the science, right? So if you look at, for instance, renewable energy is a really sort of analogous industry and it, it has kind of proliferated the global south significantly as well with off-grid solar, et cetera. It has its own issues, of course, but um, last year, the last three years, actually, we, we got close to 30% of global electricity from renewable sources. That's great, that's fantastic, right? So if we can do the same here, there, there's a huge opportunity to, to get to a much better place from a planetary health standpoint. Thank you. I'm aware we're now out of time. And in a minute, I'd like to uh, bring in Core to offer some sort of um, roundup reflections. Um, for now, um, it, I'm asking each of the four of you to, um, and I'm going to give you 30 seconds each maximum, and I'm going to cut you off because we really are out of time, to, to say where you feel that 
there has been some commonality and some agreement in this discussion. Whether you've heard anything that has changed or at least modified your opinion and what you think we should do to overcome polarization and you get 30 seconds each. Who'd like to start? Jude, I'm gonna volunteer you. I was just clicking on mute as you did. Um, so I think the the really nice thing about this, and actually before you'd asked us, before you'd said what you wanted us to say, I was just writing down synergies because there have been, despite our very sort of polarized point of view, there have been so many synergies. And I think that's how we overcome the polarization. You know, we all care about the planet. We all care about lower carbon. We all care about animal health, people health, public health, you know, all of these things. Let's work on the commonalities and then try to change the systems rather than coming at it as I am A, you are B. We can't talk to each other because we hate each other. So, yeah, that's my biggest take home. And, and very quickly, anything that's changed your mind, modified your opinion? Um. Honestly, no, but I think we could talk about this for seven weeks okay. and have a far deeper... We can't do that now. So. Um, Varun, really quickly, if you don't mind. Yeah, I want to I echo what was just said by Jude in terms of the, the kind of... I'm very glad that we can come together to have these conversations, grateful to you, Tara, and I think there are synergies. Uh, I mentioned this in, this in the chat. Some of the most promising approaches we have seen have been farmer transition programs and stuff we've been doing in places like India to grow mung beans as a complementary crop, a rotation crop that flows in here even for dairy farmers, right? So there's an opportunity here, I think, to bring these visions together, and I'm really excited to work together to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Adele and Ian, um, ideally 20 seconds. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of synergies here, which I'm not surprised at. I think, you know, if we're going to go forward with this, we really have to start thinking in terms of bringing all the academics together to work with farmers, because we're not going to do it on our own. We need those farmers to make this work. Absolutely. And no, no, nothing's changed my mind. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, echo, echo what we, has been said already about, I think there's probably parts of the solution in, in all four of, of what we've been saying here. Um, I think my, my big takeaway is, you know, rather than working from the top down, we've really got to, to think about solutions from the bottom up and think about what, what are the farms um, looking like that are going to be part of the climate, nature and health solution? And then what do those farms produce and how can we as citizens align our diets uh, to those to those farms which are a part of the solution? So I would encourage us to think from the bottom up, put farmers at the heart of this solution uh, and see, see where we get to. Thank you. Thank you. Um... So, Cor, now over to you. Um, everything you've heard, um, we haven't got through remotely all the things we could have got through. Um, yeah, thank you, Tara. Um, yeah, I've been listening um, with great interest, uh, naturally, and uh, so many good things have been said. And um, since I've, I only have a few minutes, I can have no hope of, the, of going into details. So my only option, I think, is to zoom out a little bit uh, and, um, and, and try to take a kind of um, look at the whole. Uh, and then the first thing that strikes me is that when you talk about these things, there is a tension between talking in terms of scenarios, which are kind of endpoints, where you want to go, what, what is the ideal future that you are trying to work towards. And on the other hand, uh, uh, thinking in terms of process. So uh, starting to change and not knowing where you will end uh, uh, actually. Um, <clears throat> and I think that um, when we are um, talking about these very, um, these very uh, deep uh, change, uh, uh, societal changes such as the protein transition, um, I think maybe even 10 years ago, we still thought of that in terms of taking steps, being focused, being very dedicated towards, towards a goal. But we have now learned to think in terms of uh, transitions that are out of our control and that, um, uh, that are so complex that the, that change is nonlinear and nobody is really uh, able to control the whole process. Uh, think, for example, uh, there are a few uh, evidence things that we are not in control of in this process. We don't know how uh, cellular agriculture will develop yet, what the products will look like. 
We don't know what crisis uh, in the future we are uh, looking forward. We don't know exactly how policy will develop uh, in response, for example, to such crises. So there's a lot of things that, that we do not control. Uh, and and um, given that, I think we need to live with, uh, with this with lack of control. And then it's, I think it's encouraging to see that there is indeed, as, as all the panelists, uh, uh, I think, um, emphasized at the end, there's already a lot of energy. And I think that the discussion is already quite different than, for example, 10 or even five years ago. Uh, we all agree that uh, waste and zoonotic diseases and, and, and big power uh, inequalities are very bad things. And we all agree that biodiversity uh, is good and that the, the soil is very important and that animal welfare is very important. And that also, I think, uh, has been leading up to a greater uh, feeling in, in Western societies, at least, that there is a, really a need uh, for eating less meat. And I, th that's a tendency that's also clearly uh, visible here in our panelists. In the Netherlands, we had a survey um, last year um, among a large number of, of uh, people. And even, um, even people who voted right-wing uh, were, the majority of them was convinced that we eat to, need to eat less meat. So when you think about that, um, I think um, there is indeed uh, reason to, to be worried about the polarization that is encouraged by the press, because in reality, the polarization might be less, at least among the public. Uh, and it's, it's not always visible. Uh, people are not yet behaving uh, according to their doubts and their uh, discomfort that they are increasingly feeling with, uh, with, for example, with animal welfare and intensive husbandry. But nevertheless, something is, is clearly changing. On the other hand, talking about polarization, polarization, of course, is, is also real. Uh, I mean, when, when transitions uh, really um, come to something, they, they start to become serious then you can also expect big clashes and, uh, and, and we, have to, uh, we, have, we will have to deal with them. I mean, there are big, big, big uh, conflicts of interest that, uh, that cannot be avoided. There are also big conflicts of insights that cannot be avoided. But as I said, I think uh, um, um, underneath that all, underneath those clashes, we are moving um, as a society as a whole in a certain direction. Although um, I also think in Wageningen we have um, a change specialist who says, do realize when nobody is in control, it's not certain that the tipping points will go in the right direction. I mean, it's not, it's not the darker scenarios are also uh, quite possible and they tend to be neglected perhaps a little bit. So uh, uh, wrapping up, um, because I think my few minutes are already almost over. Um, there are a lot of things, um, even if there are so many uh, synergies uh, that, that we, we still don't agree uh, on completely. I mean, how well can we live without meat, uh, for example? Um, what to do with the land? Or how to think about scale? Uh, how do we arrange uh, a responsible uh, distribution of power? I mean, these are all still um, things that uh, many discussions need to be uh, had uh, and changes need to be had also. And there are a lot of uncertainties I already mentioned. Uh, it's, it's still very unclear how the cellular agriculture alternatives will really develop as market products. Uh, policy uh, uh, measures will, are uncertain, prices are uncertain. Uh, and I think that the importance of of uh, discussions like these and, and many other discussions and initiatives is um, to feed the whole discussion with, uh, with the creative energy of new ideas, uh, concrete examples um, uh, and, and new business models and what have you. Um, and not the least among those new things is I think to offer new perspectives to farmers. Uh, I think that is really dearly needed. Um, so maybe that's a good point to end.
Thank you, thank you very much, Cor. So um, we are out of time, so I'm going to um, say very little else except to um, thank you all very, very much. I think we're all agreed that um, there needs to be much, much more involvement of farmers uh, in discussions that the, the, the kind of somewhat cooked up polarization uh, uh, between meat eaters and vegans or farmers and vegans is often manufactured by the media rather than um, visible, you know, in reality. Um, and that I guess we all need to fumble our way through to a better future as best we can. So um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed to everyone and to everyone uh, participating in, in our audience. And um, a recording of this will be available in due course. Thank you. Have a good mm. afternoon. Bye-bye. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.